welcome to Farm to Stable, a science-based equine nutrition podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nettie Leibert. I'm a lifelong horse person and professional equine nutritionist with the goal of helping horses and their humans create balanced diets to set them up for success, no matter what age, discipline, or circumstance. Disclaimer, the information discussed here is based on current scientific research and is for educational purposes only. Every horse's individual needs vary. This is not a substitute for veterinary medicine or nutrition consultation. Welcome back to Farm to Stable, an equine nutrition podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nettie Leibert, and we're returning after a little bit of a hiatus. And here in the Northeast United States, the temperatures are dropping. Now, while it has been an unusually warm fall, now finally we're starting to get into more normal temperatures. Uh, So it's chilly in the morning. And it's also the time of year when many people gear up to head south for warmer climates, whether they're horse showing or their snowbirds just trying to escape the winter. And of course, they bring their horses with them, and many for competition purposes. But one of the things that sometimes happens when you bring a horse to a warm, hot, humid climate from a colder climate is something called anhydrosis. Now, it's not widespread, but it does happen. And it is a question that I have been asked a couple of times is, Uh, throughout my career as a nutritionist, how do I feed a horse with anhydrosis? So we're going to get into all of that. What even is anhydrosis? So we're going to talk about a few things to do with that today, a little bit of the history, what it is, where we're at. And unfortunately, we don't know a lot, but we do know a few things. So let's get into it. So what is anhydrosis? Essentially, it is a decreased ability to sweat despite an increase in body temperature or a lack of or insufficient sweating. Now, horses, like people, the main way that they cool their bodies is to sweat, right? Producing the moisture on the skin that evaporates and takes with it some heat so that you can maintain a normal physiological body temperature. Now, horses that live or work in very hot, humid climates are most often affected. So it has been estimated That about 2% of horses living in Florida, for example, have experienced anhydrosis, most commonly in competition barns, a little less so on ranches. That was a study published in the uh, American Veterinary Medical Association Journal in 2010. So it was a survey, but at least it gives us an estimate of how much is out there. So aside from the obvious of a horse not sweating, what are some signs that a horse may be experiencing this? They're very similar to signs of heat stress. A horse might be panting or rapidly breathing. We know that horses don't pant. Their nostrils may flare. And you can see all the vessels uh, come to the surface as they try to dissipate heat. Their coat may appear abnormally dry when you would expect it to be damp or wet with sweat. And of course, because of this, they're very hot, they can't dissipate heat, they're going to feel lethargic, and performance is going to decline, they may look exhausted. Now, horses typically don't completely 100% lose the ability to sweat, they may still sweat on their necks, for example, but they may not be sweating underneath the saddle or between their hind legs, where they normally will sweat quite a bit to dissipate that heat. So the magic question is, what causes anhydrosis? The answer is, we don't really know. The molecular and physiological causes are not fully understood, although there are some pretty good working theories. So treatment largely relies right now on environmental management. So the cause may be related to the sweat gland itself. It could be related to the adrenal glands, thyroid hormones, electrolytes, But the reasons, again, are not fully understood, and there aren't really any known medical treatments to cure anhydrosis. Some horses can experience it episodically. Some horses are chronic, non-sweaters, as we call them. So it really just depends on the individual. But I want to talk for just a second about the sweat gland. And before you go, ugh, it's very important. So even though sometimes it might drive you crazy if you're trying to stay clean and fresh and dry for an event, your sweat glands are very important. And they are stimulated by adrenaline. So if you've ever felt anxious or nervous and notice your palms get sweaty or you're suddenly starting to sweat when you're not really doing a lot of physical activity... That's part of the reason why. It's because adrenaline could be pumping through your body. Same for your horse. Now, horses that exercise long-term in these hot, humid climates 
can sometimes become desensitized and less responsive to adrenaline. So they're constantly working, they're constantly sweating, constantly being stimulated by this adrenaline to make them sweat and do what's normal. And the thought is that sometimes these glands just get, they just shut out the noise and they stop responding to the signals from adrenaline to sweat. And as I mentioned, the complete loss of sweat function is pretty rare. And most horses, you'll still see sweat around the neck, although at a reduced rate, approximately one third of normal, but sweating is typically absent over the rest of the body. So how else do we manage it? Well, there are some horses that simply just can't tolerate the hot, humid climate. I've had friends that have had to move their horses from the southern United States to the northern United States so that they could better manage the temperatures. Another way that it can be managed is acclimatization. Now, if you think way back if you were around in 1996 and you remember the Olympic Games took place in Atlanta, Georgia in the southern United States in the height of the summer, July into August. And this presented an opportunity for researchers to look at how do we manage this heat in horses, especially if we have an issue of non-sweating. Basically, the bottom line is you need a minimum of 10 to 14 days for a horse to adapt to a new climate. But how did they get there? Well, there was a study done where horses were brought from Europe to Atlanta in this hot summer heat in the USA. And as researchers observed these horses, it appeared that it took about 14 days for them to become used to the new climate. And of course, the authors could not rule out the effect of transport stress as a factor either, but they did see horses tend to improve their overall demeanor and performance over that course of at least about two weeks. Now, there was another study conducted at the University of Guelph by one of my graduate mentors, Dr. Regor, that exposed thoroughbreds to hot, humid conditions, and the horses exercised for one hour. Well, they had one hour not exercising, then they exercised moderately for about an hour, and then they had two more hours not exercising just in that climate. And it took about 10 days before researchers observed a decrease in how much heat the horses were storing in their body during exercise. And so those, some of those physiological adaptations suggested that the horses improved their tolerance to those hotter, more humid conditions over time when exposed to them and given the chance to adapt. So a lot of these studies, again, pertain to the competition for the Atlanta Games, and horses that were given time to adjust to the climate were less likely to develop dehydration, heat stress, heat exhaustion. A very small percentage of horses may not respond to acclimatization, but most of them do when given time and proper avenue to do so. So acclimation may partly restore some of the reduced performance you see. So if you get to a nice warm climate on day one and you try to do your normal routine, your horse may not respond the way they usually do. But given a gradual increase or maybe a takedown of work and a gradual buildup again, you may see that after two weeks, they're closer to being back to normal. Now, there is some anecdotal evidence that acupuncture may help these non-sweaters, although the mechanism of how that works is not understood. And that's something that might work for some horses and not work for others. I personally love acupuncture for myself. It has helped my back quite a bit. But again, it's all very individual. Now, how else are we going to manage these horses? Well, as I mentioned earlier, starting with a decreased work level, especially if you're in, say, the New England states here in the United States uh, through December, and then all of a sudden you're going down to Florida for the show season there. It's going to be warm, not necessarily 90 degrees and humid, but it's going to be notably warmer. So one of the things you want to do is just back off the work level for a couple of days, still ride, still exercise, but maybe instead of doing an intense training day, you do a nice hack or take your horse out on a trail or something a little less intense. It is key to work during the cooler times of the day. If you're like me and you still want to ride in the summer, but if the forecast is going to be a little sticky for the day, you find it is much cooler in the morning. And that is the case. The uh, surface temperatures are cooler just before dawn. Now, granted, it might be a little dark then, but if you get to the barn first thing in the morning, uh, the temperatures tend to be the coolest, even if humidity is a little bit higher. So later evening, also an option. 
and you want to avoid working during the hottest parts of the day. And this should probably sound familiar to you even for yourself. So between uh, like 12 and 3 is one guideline, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So that general middle of the day peak sunshine time. Typically the hottest part of the day is what you want to avoid. If competitions are scheduled during that time, you know, you may have to adjust your competition schedule or who knows, sometimes competitions um, increasingly so are aware of some of these conditions and say, you know what, we need to postpone until a day where it's going to be cooler. So sometimes show officials are becoming more cognizant of some of these issues. But again, working during the cooler times of day are important or if you're fortunate enough to have an air conditioned barn, even better. It is also going to be key to just understand what some of the symptoms of heat stress in horses are and for yourself as well. So this can happen in people too. So it's important that everybody working with your horses knows what to look for. So if you see that horse panting, if it's hot and he should be sweating and you don't think that they're sweating enough or you see changes in how or the amount that they sweat, this is important. Hopefully your horse show officials are up on that too, but this can include trainers, riders, grooms, anybody working around the horses. Providing shade seems kind of obvious, right? Even if your horse is not competing and they're just out during the day, uh, having a shaded area or even bringing them into the barn and having fans or misting systems. These are some innovations, the misting systems that came out of a lot of that research when they were studying horses at the Atlanta Games. So it does help. It really does help horses cool, especially if they're having trouble sweating. Veterinary monitoring, obviously key. It seems to go without saying, but I don't feel I'd be doing my job without saying if you have any suspicions that something might not be correct, you've got to call your vet immediately. Horses that are not acclimatized, so let's say you go from the cold New England states down to Florida for your show season and you just start going, again, you might find that they are not as tolerant of exercise or your training routine that they were at home. So again, just give them that time to adjust. Go down a little early if you can manage that and give them time to adjust so that when it comes time to compete, you're ready to go. Being a nutrition podcast, of course, I have to mention, how do you manage these horses from a diet standpoint? And the answer is, well, we're not sure, but there are a few things that we do know. There could be, okay, I wouldn't even say we know this definitively, but there could be some dietary factors that could potentially aggravate anhydrosis and without getting into all of the biochemistry and metabolism nitty gritty, excessive protein in the diet. Well, generally not harmful to horses. I want to stress that. You know, I've been on my protein soapbox in this podcast before. Metabolism of protein produces heat. I mean, so does fermentation of forage, of course. But if you are feeding way more protein than you need to to these horses who suffer from anhydrosis, it could just be an aggravating factor and something that is pretty easily remedied with a slight diet adjustment. Horses that are being fed very high energy diets that aren't necessarily using that energy, uh, very high starch and sugar diets, high calorie diets that don't necessarily need it. Uh, one, you run the risk of them gaining too much weight, but the other is uh, if they have all this energy to burn and nowhere to burn it off, it could potentially aggravate uh, the heat buildup in the body. A again, that that's very general and a lot more study is needed on that. So I would not bet my career on those statements, but it is potentially something to think about. So other dietary considerations, some are just really basic, making sure your horse consumes enough water. Very simple, clean, fresh water available all the time. Ideally, if it's cooler water, I know sometimes in hot climates, it's hard to keep water at, say, room temperature or tap cool. But if the water source is shaded or changed frequently, or even if you have an automatic waterer, sometimes that can be an option to help keep water temperatures down as the horse consumes it. So a lot of options there. Balancing energy intake, making sure your horse is taking in what is appropriate for their body type and their activity level and their general situation. And many times I will recommend to people who come to me with this issue, you know, let's maybe give your horse some electrolytes. So it's not a magic bullet, but electrolytes will help encourage your horse to take in more water. It's not going to cure anhydrosis, but again, when they are fully hydrated, it does help to maintain body temperature overall, among other things. So unfortunately, there is no magic cure that we know of yet via diet, via medical uh, treatment, via anything, but there are some things 
that you can do to help manage your horse who, if they have trouble sweating or managing their body temperature in hotter climates. So how each horse responds is of course individual uh, and you just kind of have to do a little trial and error sometimes working with your veterinarian and your nutritionist to make sure everything is in balance. So welcome back to the Farm to Stable Equine Nutrition Podcast. If you have topics you'd like to hear about, questions or anything of of that nature, please reach out to equinenutritionphd at yahoo.com. Happy to hear from you and thank you for listening. I look forward to some more episodes coming soon. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of Farm to Stable, a science-based equine nutrition podcast. Please share and subscribe if you found the content interesting. And if you have a topic you'd like to hear about, send it to equinenutritionphd at yahoo.com.